Are you considering acquiring a new pair of loudspeakers and wondering if your existing amplifier will be able to drive them? Or maybe you want to determine how loud you can play music in a particular room using a speaker amplifier combination. This video will help you answer some of these types of questions. If your amplifier delivers more power than the loudspeaker can handle, it could destroy the speaker drivers or crossover unit inside the cabinet when the amplifier delivers more power for a loud musical passage, even if you're listening at a moderate sound level. Conversely, if your amplifier delivers less power than a loudspeaker requires, when the loudspeaker requires more power to handle a loud passage, the amplifier will go beyond its rated power and may start clipping the output signal going into the loudspeaker. This results in massive distortion, which can destroy your loudspeakers. At either extreme, you could literally see your loudspeaker investment go up in smoke if you aren't careful. We tend to view a music listening system as a bunch of components connected with some wires without giving much thought to how they will interact with each other. Let's take a more holistic view, treating these components as part of a system. There could be a number of source devices, like a record player, a CD player, or a DAC streamer that plays digital audio files from a computer or via the internet. These devices connect to the amplifier via RCA interconnect cables, and as long as the source devices conform to industry standards regarding output voltage and impedance, they will interact well with all amplifiers. The amplifier is typically a voltage gain device. If it provides a voltage gain factor of 10, it will take a 2 volt input signal and increase it to 20 volts. It will amplify the music signal from source devices to the levels expected by loudspeakers. Speaker wires connect the output terminals of the amplifier to the input terminals of the loudspeakers. And for multi-driver speakers, the signal goes into a crossover unit inside the cabinet. Here is a picture of the crossover unit in an LS35A speaker. And here is a schematic of what a crossover circuit looks like. Loudspeaker crossover designers use resistors, capacitors, and inductors to let certain frequencies through to a driver while blocking other frequencies that the driver is not designed to handle. At the same time as these components are doing their work, directing frequencies, uh, they are also impeding the flow of electricity at various frequencies. The term impedance is used to describe this loudspeaker characteristic. We will see later on how loudspeaker impedance can affect an amplifier's ability to supply electrical power to a loudspeaker. Other speaker parameters that have a role in determining amplifier power are sensitivity, efficiency, and phase angle, and I'll explain these terms later. The last component of an audio system is something nobody talks about, but everyone is aware of. This is the room in which you are listening to music. Have you come across any hi-fi equipment reviews that mention the characteristic of the listening room? Room dimension, air volume, and acoustical treatment all play a role. Here is a stepwise approach that may help in narrowing your choices of loudspeaker or amplifier candidates. Step one is understand loudspeaker and amplifier specifications. I will investigate the amplifier needs of two quite different loudspeakers. Both are modern versions of vintage speakers designed in the last century. The LS35A loudspeaker was designed by the British Broadcasting Corporation in the mid-1970s to be used inside BBC mobile broadcasting trucks as small studio monitors. Audiophiles soon discovered that they sounded great in a home environment and the rest, as they say, is history. The Klipsch Heresy loudspeaker dates back even further, to the mid-1950s. They were designed to be used as a center-fill speaker for stereo setups in movie theaters 
and later on in churches. The irony of using something called heresy in churches just adds to the legendary status of this fourth generation version. The important parameters for determining amplifier requirements are sensitivity, power handling, and nominal impedance. You can see that the sensitivity of the Falcon acoustic at 83 dB is relatively low, while that of the Klipsch Heresy at 99 dB is at the high end of the sensitivity scale. Sensitivity is measured with a calibrated microphone one meter from the front of the speaker and using a 2.83 volt 1000 hertz signal. That's the standard way of measuring sensitivity so that you can compare sensitivity ratings between speakers. In terms of power handling, the Falcon Acoustic can support 50 watts maximum, that is on a, a short uh, duration basis, and 30 watts of continuous power. The Klipsch Heresy can support 100 watts continuous and 400 watts of peak power. This is pretty important as it defines the upper range of how much power a speaker can handle. The nominal impedance is also important. Lower impedance speakers require more power to drive. The Falcon Acoustic is again at the high end at 15 ohms and the Klipsch Heresy at 8 ohms is about average. It's called nominal impedance because impedance varies with frequency. Here is a quick tutorial on a couple of equations that are useful in the world of audio electronics. First equation is typically called Ohm's Law and that's voltage is equal to current times resistance. The second equation is that power is equal to voltage times the current. Here's a, a simple schematic diagram of an amplifier, power source, signal source, and a load, which is a speaker. And speakers can be typically 8 ohms, 4 ohms, or 16 ohms. So from this information, we can calculate the amount of current that is drawn by the load at 8 ohms as 2.83 volts divided by 8 ohms, which is 0 0.3538 amps. At 4 ohms, the current is double that at 0 0.7075 and at 16 ohms the current is half of that which is 0 0.1768 and if we look at the power consumed by an 8 ohm load that would be 2.83 volts times 0.3538 amps which gives you 1 watt of power and the power at 4 ohms is at 2 watts or twice as much and the power consumed by the load at 16 ohms is half a watt which is half as much as what it was at 8 ohms and these two equations are very useful in understanding the relationship between voltage, current, resistance and power now let's look at amplifier specs. The Ellicott TU8600 is a single-ended triode tube amplifier designed in Japan and is available as a kit. Tube amplifier manufacturers don't seem to include much technical information in their spec sheets. The only useful power information here is that its maximum power output is 9.2 watts. And if you only know the maximum power and not the continuous RMS power, there is an equation that you can use to derive continuous RMS power. And that is that it's equal to the maximum power divided by the square root of 2, which is approximately 
four one four. Now that we know how much power loudspeakers can handle and how much power amplifiers can provide, let's move on to step two. You can see that the horizontal dimension is room volume in cubic meters and the vertical dimension is acoustic power in watts. As room volume increases, the amount of power required for any particular sound level, let's say at 80 dB, will start to increase. And this makes sense as a larger room will contain more air that has to be moved in order to create sound. At 90 dB, you will require higher acoustic power and similarly at 100 dB. So the volume of your room is important in determining how loud you can play a certain combination of amplifier and loudspeaker. Acoustic power is defined as loudspeaker efficiency in percent times an amplifier's continuous, sometimes called RMS, power rating in watts. Efficiency and sensitivity are often used interchangeably but mean slightly different things. Efficiency refers to the amount of input power used to produce sound output and is expressed as a percentage. Loudspeaker manufacturers do not specify efficiency. There is a complicated formula relating efficiency to sensitivity, but since I can't explain it, I won't present it. Wikipedia offers a simpler statement. An 85 dB sensitive speaker has an efficiency of around 0.5%, while a 95 dB sensitive speaker has an efficiency of around 4%. Assuming a linear relationship, I have interpolated the efficiency value for sensitivity levels between 85 and 95 dB. Once you know the sensitivity of your loudspeakers, you can estimate its efficiency value to use in this graph. This tool, however, doesn't factor in room acoustics. A lively room will require less acoustic power than one that is more acoustically damped. According to The Complete Guide to High-End Audio, a book by Robert Harley, an acoustically dead room will require twice as much amplifier power as that of an acoustically live room for the same sensitivity loudspeaker. To use this chart, it's helpful to understand the relationship between amplifier power and sound level. And that basically is that you need twice as much amplifier power to get an increase of 3 dB in sound level. So on this chart you can see I'm using linear graph paper since I don't have a logarithmic uh, graph paper. If I did these curved lines would probably be straight. I've started with the sensitivity specifications for each loudspeaker. With the LS35A it's 83 dB at 1 watt and with the Heresy even though it's specified at 99 dB uh, several equipment reviews suggest that this is lower, so I'm assuming 95 dB. Now, we did know from the specifications that its maximum continuous power rating is about 30 watts. So that means it can play at a continuous loudness of approximately 98 decibels at its maximum, which is about 50, it can play for short periods of time a sound level of around 100 dB, which is pretty loud. With the Heresy 4s, there's a 12 dB difference all the way through the power range. And we know a 6 dB increase is perceived as a doubling of loudness. So a 12 dB difference represents a four time increase in perceived loudness. So even at one watt it's playing at 95 decibels and at its maximum 
recommended continuous power of 100 watts, it can play in excess of 113 decibels, which is probably too loud for you, uh, and could, if on a continuous basis, uh, could actually damage your hearing. Step four is to understand impedance and phase angle charts. Impedance, which we touched on briefly, is comprised of resistance from resistors and reactance from inductors and capacitors used in the loudspeaker's crossover circuit. A loudspeaker with low impedance, say 4 ohms, requires more power to drive than one with higher impedance, such as 8 ohms. However, if it dips too low, let's say 2 ohms, the amplifier will see a virtual short circuit which could cause a current surge from the AC power line and it would damage the amplifier unless the amplifier's fuse blows. To find a speaker's impedance over a frequency range, you will have to search for test reports from third parties, such as hi-fi magazines. Impedance curves are also accompanied by another related parameter called phase angle. A shift in phase between the voltage and current of an audio signal occurs over the frequency range because of the action of capacitors and inductors in the crossover circuit. Got a sine wave here which shows the voltage and the current in phase. But at certain frequencies the current will either lead or lag the voltage curve. So let's say the red is the current curve and you can see for small phase angles there's not really uh, a big deal. At say 45 degree angle you can see that let's say it's at maximum voltage but the current is about 50 percent of its maximum. So therefore we know that the power which is equal to voltage times current is about 50 percent less than when it was perfectly in phase. And if we keep going at say 90 degrees or close to 90 degrees you'll see that you have maximum voltage but your current is virtually zero. So there's no power going to or very little power going to your loudspeakers. Now what this means in the real world is does it actually have an effect on the frequency response of your loudspeaker? Uh, so the way to look at this is to find the extreme phase angles of that loudspeaker at th those frequencies and go back to the frequency response curve of that speaker to see if there are any major anomalies. Uh, one would hope that the speaker designer has designed these anomalies outside or beyond uh, to exclude these effects. So to wrap up, the room is part of the hi-fi audio system. More acoustic power is required to achieve a desired listening level in a bigger room. A high sensitivity loudspeaker will sound louder than a lower sensitivity speaker given the same amount of amplifier power. Also, be aware that there is no correlation between loudspeaker's price and its sensitivity, but there is a correlation between an amplifier's price and its power. Generally speaking, a 100 watt amplifier will cost more than a 10 watt amplifier. Given what I've learned, I would use my LS35A speakers in a smaller room or pair it with a higher powered amplifier if I want to play at a louder level. My Heresy 4 loudspeakers pair well with my 9 volt tube amp in my listening room. I can listen at low, moderate or high sound levels without losing any detail, clarity or transparency. One word of caution, if you play vintage records Clicks and pops and surface noise may be more noticeable on a high sensitivity speaker. 
If you find this distracting, a lower sensitivity speaker may be for you. But then you might miss some low-level musical detail present on a recording. I hope the tips in this video will help you find the best amplifier match to drive your loudspeakers.